Thank you, Tracy. Uh, I uh, really appreciate the invitation to speak, and um, I got the fun part of the program. I get to give you my opinions, and hopefully if I do a reasonably good job, it will spark some thinking. But you need to be forewarned. My opinions, I would like to believe, are based on some knowledge and experience, but they are truly also based on my social and political predispositions. So uh, please, I hope I will uh, be successful in getting you to think a little bit. What I want to do is spend my time really doing three things. I want to talk a little bit about what I think are the three key areas where there really needs to be fundamental change in order to have health reform that actually changes things and can be sustained over time. Secondly, I'm going to make some very, very short comments on the three remaining candidates for president. Catherine did such a good job of describing it, I'll just sort of fill in around the edges. And then I want to give you some personal comments about really the chances for success of reform and what are really sort of, at least in my mind, the most likely scenarios. So let's talk about what are really the areas for which we need to have fundamental change. I think there are basically three areas here. You know, and there's lots of ways when trying to think about a complex problem like this that you can group things. But I group them in three areas. The first thing is coverage. Whatever comes out of reform, I think it only succeeds if we get universal insurance coverage or near universal insurance coverage or as a proxy for it, universal access to needed care which is slightly different. The second piece is financing. There truly needs to be financing reform. And financing, I'm talking about how do you raise the money to pay for the health care that individuals consume. And what's needed here is a method of financing that actually will lead to the continuity of coverage and the predictability of coverage over time. We're great coming up with short-term solutions. We're not so good in the financing area of actually thinking through a system that will survive 10, 15, 20 years. The third area, and these all three are linked, is cost control. Effectively, we need to recognize that we cannot really raise enough money in the financing side to truly fund the system that we have created. So there has to be a lowering of existing costs and predictability and lowering of the trend going forward. And quite honestly, the cost issue, I think, is the most difficult one to solve. And it is also probably the one that has created the crisis in terms of coverage and financing. So it's really the driver here. And let me talk a little bit about the three areas. Coverage. I actually think coverage is probably the easiest issue to resolve. There are lots of ways. We've had lots of talks about it. Expand public programs, player pay, single payer, uh, tax credits, this, this individual mandates. There's lots of ways to mix and match the different approaches. And there seems to be pretty good consensus that we should do something in this area. A key problem here is going to be, as Catherine was talking about, benefit packages. And what do you really set as the, the, the benefit package you're going to pay for? And it is really true. The more loaded the benefit package is, 
the more expensive it is, the more difficult the financing problem becomes. So I think we could see reform going anywhere from a catastrophic coverage guarantee to more like an HMO kind of benefit with office visits and testing and things like that. Um, moving to financing. I think there are two things that really have spurred the crisis in financing. We have a system here of discretionary employer-based funding. In other words, I'm an employer. I have a choice of whether or not I pay all or part of the premiums or the cost for the coverage of my employees. And if I'm competing against Mary Ann and she decides not to do it, I'm immediately at a competitive advantage. Excuse me, competitive disadvantage. So I really do believe that what we're seeing right now going on in the employer-based insurance market is an exit of employers from the market. And they do it in lots of ways. Uh, as Catherine was talking about, you begin to increase employee copays. In fact, we're almost now adopting as a general rule. If you uh, think about what the general health care cost trend is, it's somewhere around 9% a year. Well, premiums are only going up 5 to 6% a year. And it's because of that 9%, around 4% is being shifted to the employee each year. But it's even more fundamental than that. What we have, our fastest growing insurance product at Blue Cross is a high deductible policy. And these are not $500 deductibles. These are $5,000, $10,000 deductibles. We also have lots of employers that are dropping their retiree coverage. They see that the Medicare Advantage plans have been approved. They uh, see that there are Medigap coverages through Blue Cross. And employers are getting out of the retiree market. And it has a lot to do with the costs of actually supplementing Medicare. But it also has to do with what an employer has to book on their books today for their health care costs in their future for their retirees. Uh, so you've got that happening. Um, and in some ways, I think a nice way to think about this is that we started with a defined benefit approach to health care, where a union would go in and an employer would say, this is the array of benefits I want to provide. And then each year, as cost went up, they'd play around on the edges. Now they're saying, I'm going to fix my contribution, and I'm not going to have a defined benefit. I'm going to let the benefit float based upon how much I can afford to pay. And what's sort of, to me, really interesting about this whole discussion is that as employers exit, you have some who are just very honest, very out there, and very straightforward saying, I can no longer afford it. I can no longer compete in today's world if I have to do this while other of my competitors don't do it. But a lot of this also gets played up as a new ideology, as a, as a, as a new direction for health care. So we have consumer-directed health. We have all these discussions on... Um, Consumer empowerment. Well, these actually are, to me, largely the exit strategies for a lot of employers that just simply can't afford. Because they're busy here using this ideology and in many ways truly believing in it. Because there is a real tendency, if I'm selling something in the market, a commodity, I I think the market in healthcare should work like my commodity market. And so I'm going, okay, I understand the thing of actually having people have skin in the game. That's the way markets work. And so it is 
fits with an ideology that most businesses understand, and it also fits very nice with going to a defined contribution and effectively an exit from this area. Now, there's a second issue in financing, which is also very important. Uh, and in fact, uh, Mary Ann, in her uh, little thing within the Ann Arbor News, mentioned it. Medicaid is now 25% of the state general fund budget. It is the largest single program in virtually any state government. And it is the fastest growing program. Every once in a while in a few states, prisons sort of sneaks ahead of Medicaid. But it's only a temporary blip. And then uh, Medicaid takes off again. You, there is simply not the capacity in state government to sustain Medicaid. The basic equation of how it is funded has to change. And we have every governor in the country basically saying they need relief from Medicaid. And so you have a public funding crisis and you have a private funding crisis, and it's really moving us to fight, try to do something about this. Now, let's move on a little bit to cost control and what's going on here. And as I mentioned before, cost control, I think, is really the most difficult challenge. It's not just the most difficult challenge here, it's also the one that is most likely to be handled poorly. So it's sort of like we get a double whammy. Um, what's really needed here to make health care more affordable? It isn't a bunch of rhetoric, quite honestly. I think what we're really talking about is if we really need to save money, we need to restructure the insurance and delivery processes by which we all live. And let me, I, I want to talk a little bit about this. But I, I, first let me emphasize that we're really prone when it comes to cost control to settle on the simplistic solution. So we do the skin in the game kind of thing. Or we talk about fostering competition. It's actually, if we think about saving money in health care, like we think about saving money in auto parts, we are likely to actually increase costs rather than reduce costs. So, we know that the simple solutions will not work. That's what a lot of trial and failure has told us. Now, but we are still prone to latch on to them. Let me talk a little bit about what fundamental reform might look like. One piece of it, and actually um, the Democratic candidates are on it, and it is true, pharmaceuticals. Pharmaceutical costs up to about four or five years ago when sort of the new development pipelines dried up um, really were on the leading edge of driving health care costs throughout all of the 1990s. And they have become a very, very large component of total health spend. And they are a driver because we've got problems relative to our system of patents. Our patent approvals go for too long. We also allow a lot of Me Too products into a patent protection uh, system, and we effectively the patents keep the free market from operating. And what we need within the drug business is actually more free market. We need products to actually compete with one another. Then let's talk about insurance. Now I think I know a little bit about insurance. In insurance, you know how insurers compete? In fact, the best way to compete as an insurer, the best way to compete is to insure healthy people. Because I'm going to make a ton of money if you never go to see the doctor. 
And most of what goes on in the insurance industry, if we were really going to be honest about it, is risk-based competition. You try to not say that, but the whole game is in your underwriting practices and everything to try to get the healthier piece of the population. And you remember from the, the first Medicare HMO days? Because the way you could make money in Medicare in an HMO in 1990 is if you got the seniors who were healthier. Well, how do you do that? Because you can't cheat. Well, you do things like you put your enrollment office at the third floor of a building without an elevator. <laughs> you know, there are great ways to get healthier populations. You think about affinity benefits with health club membership. People who are going to be attracted to a health benefit attached to a health club are going to be the healthier people. So, now, it's, it's not just competition, though, based upon risk. We have an unbelievably complicated insurance system. Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan. We only do business in Michigan. You know how many different benefit designs we administer just for groups in Michigan? Over 15,000. Now, every benefit design actually is determined by what we call medical payment rules. These are your definitions that drill down into the benefits of actually define what you're going to pay for. We have hundreds of thousands of medical benefit payment rules. And what is that medical benefit payment rule? Okay, Think about something very sort of mundane. There are some people, because of medical conditions, need special shoes. So there are probably about 30 different medical payment rules about medical shoes. What conditions you must have in order to qualify, what types of shoes payment will be made for, what co-pays and deductibles are needed based upon the condition and the shoes that could be approved for you. And virtually every self-insured group has a different sort of fit on the matrix of medical shoes. Now, medical shoes is just one of thousands of different things. So we have a very, very complicated business here that we're trying to administer. And it is expensive to administer. Let me give you a sense in the current market about what constitutes efficiency and what doesn't. Good way of looking at this is looking at what we call the medical loss ratio. Medical loss ratio looks at the premium you collect, and it says out of that premium you collect, what percentage of it actually goes to providers to pay for benefits. So if you have a medical loss ratio of 90%, the plan is getting 10% in administration, and 90% is going to the provider. So work with me a little bit on this. If your medical loss ratio is in 110%, you're about to go out of business, right? Because you can't fund your administration, and your benefits are significantly higher than the premium you're collecting. So let's go to the individual market, selling insurance to individuals. Right now in today's market, if you're not taking any profit out of this and you're administering and trying to sell insurance to individuals, the lowest, or I'd say the highest, loss ratio you can get is about 80 to 85%. So in other words, somewhere between 15 and 20 percent simply has to be spent on administration. And wh why the cost? Well, to reach individuals, there is a tremendous cost in terms of marketing. And you tend to market through agents. And all of a sudden you're thinking about a distribution system 
and needing to pay. You also need to advertise. And you probably, if you're selling to individuals, you need to advertise on TV. And that's pretty expensive. So even if you're a company that's not trying to make any money, you're stuck with a fixed cost of 15 to 20 percent. Now, if you happen to be a company that wants to make money, like the for-profits, they're going to want to achieve on the individual market a loss ratio of about 60 to 65 percent. So 40, 35 to 40 percent of effectively the premium you're paying goes to profit and administration. This is just, whether it be the 80 to 85 or the 60 to 65, they're both too high. There has to be reform to bring down the cost of insurance. And there's lots of ways to do it. And it, I think it has, it's absolutely critical to having a success out of health reform. Now, I have a strong bias here. I think insurance should be nonprofit. I think insurance is a social good. And I think it is absolutely horrible that insurers compete based upon risk. Insurers are there for a public purpose. Community rating is the basic approach that should be used. And there needs to be a way of sort of working through that rather than simply making this as something where you can make money. And I think Marianne was absolutely right in saying we're involved with a bunch of industries here. We're not involved with actually trying to deliver health care to a population. Now, cost control. I think there's an old thing that says form follows financing, and then here it absolutely fits. Most all of us pay providers on what we call a fee-for-service basis. The more you do, the more you get. It's a great incentive for really holding down costs. And so when we need to say, in fact, we have this like little rule we go by, and that if we need to cut provider rates to save money, we know if we cut provider rates by one dollar, we'll actually only save 50 cents. Because utilization will go up to partially compensate for a reduction in fees. So we have a financing system here that has helped promote a very, very inefficient delivery system. And the fee-for-service system actually promotes a good deal of overtreatment. And I personally believe if we're going to do something on the delivery side, we really have